Hello, good afternoon. My name is David Russell Jensen. My clinkant name is Shaka Guk. I'm Te Kui Di, child of the Kwashki Kwan and a grandchild of the Shukakari. I work here at Sealaska Heritage. I am the development officer. I am pleased to welcome you this afternoon to our uh, lecture series for Native American Heritage Month. Uh, thank you for those who are in the audience for providing your proof of vaccination. Um, please remain masked during the duration of the lecture if you're here joining us in person. There are bathrooms available on the second floor if you need to use those. And at this time, can you please silence your cell phones? Um, here at Sea Alaska Heritage, we strive to provide programming for you that you'll be interested in participating in, including celebration, baby raven reads, and other language, culture, art, and educational programs. Uh, we're, we depend quite heavily on grants. However, individual contributions are also essential for our operations to continue. Uh, thank you to those who donate. And uh, we would also ask that if you are not a donor, if you'd uh, consider contributing at a level that's appropriate for you. Uh, if you'd like to donate uh, online, you can go to sealaskaheritage.org slash donate. Uh, lecture today is titled Retelling American Literature Through Raven's Song and is presented by Dr. Sarah Rivett. Dr. Rivett is the author of The Science of the Soul in Colonial New England, 2011, and Unscripted America, Indigenous Languages and the Origins of a Literary Nation, 2017. She is currently writing a book on ravens in American literary history. There will be an opportunity for questions at the end. Please type your questions in the chat or save them if you're in the audience today. Thanks, and welcome, Dr. Rivett. Thank you for that introduction, and I want to begin by thanking the Sealaska Heritage Institute for inviting me. I'm honored to be included in the lecture series taking place this month. And I've also been trying to come here since June 2020, so I'm especially thrilled to have the opportunity to be here in person. So I'm from Princeton, New Jersey, which is in Lenapokin, meaning in the Lenape language, land where Lenape live. Beginning in the late 17th century, Thousands of Lenape were displaced. Now, in addition to New Jersey, Lenape live in Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and Ontario, far from their ancestral land. Today in Lenapokin are hundreds of items taken from this land, southeastern Alaska in the 19th century. The profoundly disruptive impact of the displacement of people and things from ancestral lands informs my talk today. Part of what I hope to do by being here in person is to physically connect to the land that the Bentwood box featured on the first slide belongs to. In the Princeton University Art Museum is a Clinkett Bentwood box. The artist or artists who created it were from the Clinkett Raven Moiety, either the Lucknoxidi or the Kotchidi. Three sides of the box are seamless. A solid piece of wood was scored and steamed to make three corners. The two ends then stitched together to enclose the box, forming a symmetrical square. Rich carvings appear on either side of the box. On close inspection, one can see the faded red and sea green paint made from Vivianite and okra. Two images flank two sides of the chest. On one side sits a frog. Its legs wrap at the box's lower edge onto the box's underside. A raven occupies the adjacent corner with narrowly aligned eyes, a long beak below flared nostrils, and wings folded against the body. The box can be read from all angles, and as if by magic, the form shifts along with the viewer's perspective. Observing this Bentwood box beneath institutional lights in an archival room of a museum makes its dislocation self-evident. Its status is that of an archival captive its continued presence in a colonial collection, an ongoing act of violence against the people from whom it was taken. The Bentwood box exists in an unsettling state of displacement. In storage as an object of imperial accumulation, it is severed from its historical and cultural context, with not enough known in its present location of its, of its significance as atu, or as a work of art. But in fact, the box contains the spiritual and mythical core of a vibrant culture thousands of miles away. Repatriation seems the only ethically appropriate recourse, but the story does not end here. What else needs to be done to address cultural discontinuities 
amplified by the plunder of such artifacts of cultural memory, in this instance, more than 140 years ago. What would it mean to consider the box as an object that steadfastly resists settler categories of knowledge? Because this particular Bentwood box features a raven that morphs so seamlessly as if to appear to be an animate living representation, I read Clinkett raven stories alongside the box to try to listen for the knowledge that it contains. Like the box itself, the Clinkett raven cannot be easily understood through Western cultural, literary, and theological categories. Clinkett scholars Nora Marks Dauenhauer, Richard Dauenhauer, and Lance Twitchell describe the raven as a liminal figure merging the categories of trickster and cultural hero. Described as, quote, a mythical handyman who fixes things up out of cosmic leftovers, Raven serves an important function of conveying intergenerational memory. The removal of the Bentwood box from the geographical site of its creation disrupts intergenerational memory, and this is precisely what the Raven stories help to recover. In addition to contextualizing the box, the Clinkett Raven cycle from which the stories come reveals new insights about the Raven as a Judeo Christian and Anglo American literary symbol. The Book of Genesis also originates a story about a Raven, with lasting legacies in the Western literary canon, insofar as the Raven's first act is one of disobedience. Sent out by Noah on a mission, the raven fails to return to the ark. Defying Noah's instructions, the raven provides no information about the earth's habitability. There are some striking parallels between the raven and Genesis and the Clinkett raven cycle. Most notably, a flood and an act of disobedience that turns out to be integral to creation. Both Clinkett and Anglo-Christian cultures have a narrative tradition for understanding the raven as a type, character, and symbol. But the raven is often interpreted as a devil in Christian texts. Augustine attributes the sin of procrastination to the raven. For rather than return to the ark, he cries out, craw, craw. Because craw means tomorrow in Latin, Augustine interprets the sound of a raven's cry as a literal indication of postponement. Constructing a dichotomy between raven and dove, Augustine shaped the perspective of centuries of Christians. By contrast, the caw caw in Raven and Water, told by Willie Marks, as well as the gaw 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 in Raven and Whale, told by Cuchain Francatello, signals Raven's liberation. The sound precedes escape through flight from the carcass of a dead whale, a smoke hole, or a bentwood box. When considered comparatively across literary canons, the Clinkett Raven reveals why the Raven in the Book of Genesis has been such a troubling and misunderstood figure. Theologians represent the raven as devil, or as a symbol of evil, in an attempt to impose order on chaos. For raven does not permit biblical commentators to fashion a linear conception of time. As a conveyor of intergenerational memory across many literary traditions, raven stands in the way of fictive beginnings and human erasures on which both Christian theodicy and settler history depend. How the Bentwood Box Got to Princeton. Sheldon Jackson was a missionary trained at the Princeton Theological Seminary. He also set up some of the earliest US missions in Alaska, in Wrangell and Sitka. He acquired the box in or around 1877 and brought it back to the Theological Seminary in the service of higher education's function as a repository of anthropological memory. In this way, a form of institutional colonialism pulled both the Bentwood box and the Raven literature that elucidates the box's meaning into an odd orbit of misaligned signs and entangled typologies. When Sheldon Jackson brought the box to Princeton, it became part of what he calls a cabinet of curiosities, designed to showcase, quote, pagan lands to seminary students in a collection known as Sheldon Jackson's Home Mission. It soon became too big for the theological seminary, the collection that is, not the box, 
The box moved along with several other items to Gaio Hall, where it remains the property of the Department of Geology and Geophysical Sciences, and it's now on loan to the Art Museum. This institutional drift points to the inability to peg the Bentwood box to customary categories of disciplinary meaning, from religion and theology to geology and geophysical sciences to art. An epistemological restlessness is equally evident. The Clinkett box reflects a disparate worldview through the temporal and spatial orientation of its mythology. The confusion over whether to label the box part of a religious or natural history exposes Western culture's own enormous rifts between metaphysics and modern science. The very presence of the box within and between these buildings undermines the disciplinary categories that academia organizes itself around. In seeing the Clinkett box indexed as one more collectible in a repository of displaced and exoticized objects, one is forcefully struck by the realization that the institution that owns this box is still peering into a cabinet of curiosities. The evolving markers of modern disciplinary specialization simply disguise the underpinning of settler colonial ideology. Reimagining the archive and reading responsibly along its grain requires actively resisting the categories imposed on the Bentwood box and objects like it in the late 19th century. Listening to the box demands suspending the linear chronologies and discrete spheres of influence that would otherwise suggest that the Bentwood box in Princeton, New Jersey, and by extension, Clinkett Raven literature and the American literary canon are unrelated. According to Western concepts of influence, the Clinkett Raven may not have impacted Anglo-Christian writings about ravens prior to missionary knowledge of the Clinkett Raven cycle in the late 1880s. But this notion of influence would have us reject a comparison of the two canons, the Clinkett Raven cycle and ravens in Judeo-Christianity. But in fact, it does not take a great leap of imagination to see that these two ravens may have known one another for thousands of years. Viewing these traditions as discrete, singular stories disavows key archival knowledge in order to work in the service of the telos on which settler myths depend. The raven is a puzzling presence in the book of Genesis. Generally, biblical commentators have wanted to dismiss his ambiguity and assign him a purpose. This has caused great consternation over the meaning of the raven's errand. And this sets it apart from all the other animals on the ark. The raven is the most written about of all the animals on Noah's ark. Nothing in the Bible suggests the raven served a divine purpose. His godless authority and subsequent unclean status as a carry-on consuming creature coded for biblical commentators as an illegible sign. In order to arrange the world with divine purpose in mind, biblical commentators categorize the raven as demonic. As chaos, he was the antithesis to order. Forbidden in Levitical law, carry-on consumption also invokes terror in the popular imagination. Ravens are omnivorous. They do not discriminate between insects, rodents, fish, or reptiles, nor do they discriminate between human and non-human animals. For ages, in fact, they have been associated with battlefields, following armies to feast in the aftermath of combat on horses and humans. Claws tearing flesh from bone is a universal fate of the dead who fall prey to a conspiracy of ravens. And I um, repeated this picture of the Bible picture book uh, from the 14th century, because you can see, and I think it's your lower, lower right corner, um, that the raven has left the ark and found a dead horse and is snacking on the horse's eyes. And the other image um, is an illustration of a very popular ballad, first recorded in 1611, but probably um, spoken a lot, a, much older than that. The raven transforms from a figure of ambiguity in Genesis 8-7 to an emblem of the devil himself. Raven stands amorphously for fallen nature, the loss of grace in the natural world, and the ensuing chaos around the end times. Ultimately, the raven's sin in the Anglo-Christian tradition is incomprehensibility. 
As devil, the raven obscures knowledge and casts a cloud over images of divine revelation. In failing to return to the ark, the raven defied Noah's instruction while suggesting that the earth was not inhabitable, for had it been, the raven would have returned. Old Testament readers are left wondering about the fate of the bird. We know that the raven survives outside the ark, which means that it returns to the chaos of the world's unmaking, to the interstitial space between chaos and recreation. Elijah is fed by ravens in Kings, a story that John Milton retells in Paradise Regained, and that the Puritan minister Cotton Mather used as a rationale for the raven's purpose in the first American biblical commentary. But this naming of the raven's purpose requires extra biblical interpretation. Its vanishing act and subsequent reappearance establishes a biblical pattern of shadowy meanings without revelatory truths. What most puzzles biblical commentators about the raven in Genesis 8-7 is that it flies to and fro. The flight itself is nonlinear. Raven does not move in a progressive sequence. Instead, flying to and fro mimics what literary critic Eric Auerbach identifies as the movement back and forth, characteristic of the epic genre. Auerbach's example comes from the Odyssey. The maid Eurycleia is the first to recognize Odysseus on his return home. She recognizes his scar, but she drops out of the scene after washing his feet. Auerbach describes her appearance and disappearance and along with it, the revelatory truth of Odysseus' scar as exemplary of the back and forth movement of epic narration. The purpose of the back and forth movement is to fully excavate emotions and psychological thought processes, to leave nothing behind. The back and forth movement described by Auerbach resembles the function that the Dauenhauers attribute to the Raven, a gatherer of cosmic leftovers to convey intergenerational memory. The most well-known biblical echo of the ravens to and fro comes in Daniel, um, Daniel 12, 4, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. This is a passage about knowledge hidden and revealed. In the end times, many shall run to and fro echoes the pattern of the raven's flight, perhaps signaling that from the beginning, the raven embodied hidden knowledge. A condition of the fallen world Hidden or forbidden knowledge links the raven to the fall and makes him the embodiment of original sin in contrast to the redeemed dove. As such, the raven carries the backstory in his flight, the now forbidden knowledge of what came before. From an Auerbachian perspective, the raven is Odysseus' scar, raving as a remnant of the chaos of the world's unmaking that would otherwise be left in darkness and unexternalized. Genesis opens up a chasm through the presence of the raven that is then echoed in his episodic return, scriptural proof of the raven's survival. But the significance of the raven's appearance and disappearance is lost on biblical commentators. They don't know what to do with it. After the raven fails to return, the opposing suspense-driven narrative, the one that doesn't have this back and forth movement, comes into being. Noah sends the dove, who comes back with a sprouted olive branch, indicating that the waters had abated and that terrestrial life had returned. A more comprehensible symbol, the dove's journey is a coherent story with a beginning, middle, and an end that stands in relief to the ravens to and fro. Commentators have wondered about the distinction that Genesis sets up between the raven and dove. What is the moral lesson or allegory of each and the larger allegory of both? Disappearing without explanation and then reappearing within the same symbolic topos, the raven occupies an alternate space beyond the borders of the world that God created for humanity. As such, he represents the residue of an original chaos in the midst of the organization of nature and humanity in the Old Testament's most foundational story. It is this residue of an alternate world, an original chaos, that Christian theologians struggled to expunge. The book of Genesis has the plot of an origin story and has been interpreted as such, but in fact, it is not. In the beginning is but one beginning, but it does not tell of the time before. 
Genesis and the Gospel of John start with the phrase, in the beginning. That repeated phrase refers to the story of creation of heaven and earth, but it does not tell how the spirit of God came to be, nor does it account for the raven's resistance to the order of a telos with a beginning, middle, and end. In the beginning connotes the creation story of light and form, which appear in medias rays, for there is a backstory of formlessness, void and darkness, an alternate world that in the beginning seeks to suppress and for which the raven is a sign, chaos unbound before order is imposed. The Gnostic Gospels provide the backstory to Genesis. They were deemed heretical and suppressed until the codices on which they were written were discovered in 1945. Gnosis means knowledge in Greek. In them, a heavenly light appears to reveal the, quote, mysteries of things hidden in silence. The apostle John asks why a light being named Sophia moves to and fro. The Sophia was paired with Christ as one of two of the original light beings emanating from perfection. Um, she brings forth a being without permission from her creator, and the being she brings forth creates man in the image of God, which infuriates man. And so Sophia, in the secret book of John, is moving to and fro, pacing back and forth. And this pacing is, is revealed to be a recognition of an act of disobedience akin to the fall. The so Sophia's movement to and fro marks the transfer of power from God the mother to God the father, from chaos to order, and into a structure of binaries of sin and grace, virtue and shame. It is also a response to an action that precedes and anticipates the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. In this account, Adam is created from an act of disobedience. This is the forgotten story within the forgotten story of Gnosticism. For the same divine being that created Adam also makes him, quote, drink water of forgetfulness in order that humans might not know from whence they came. By accounting for the origins of evil and the creation of Adam, the secret book of John reveals the story behind the fall that takes place in Genesis 3. Sophia's movement to and fro connects to that of the raven as well as to the to and fro in Daniel. It is lament for knowledge lost. Perhaps the raven is the forgotten godmother or Sophia herself who was originally paired with Christ just as the raven pairs with a dove. Perhaps the to and fro in Genesis and the secret book of John is a lament for lost knowledge of origins the water of forgetfulness that Adam drinks and that washed over the earth in the flood, covering the knowledge contained in the earth's foundations. The mingling of Sophia and the raven stories through the to and fro assigns the biblical raven more power and spiritual significance than he is typically accorded. The to and fro connection permits a different way of understanding the raven. Rather than the devil, perhaps the raven is the reappearance of Sophia. From this perspective of viewing the raven as a harbinger of the story behind the story and the story behind the fall, its presence in the Bible begins to look increasingly like the raven in the clinket raven cycle. Born in Yakutat in the 1860s, Kuchain Frank Italio may have been a contemporary of the artist who created the Bentwood box. Kuchain's raven cycle is the oldest extant. With the linguistic help of her interpreter, Minnie Johnson, the anthropologist Frederica de Laguna transcribed and recorded Kuchain's version in the 1950s. Under Mount St. Elias preserves 19 versions of raven stories that circulated in Clinket culture long before the arrival of Anglo-American missionaries and anthropologists. The original cassette recording of Kuchain's version is at the American Philosophical Society and is currently being translated as part of a new edition of Raven Stories. A Bentwood box features prominently in Kuchain's version of the Raven Cycle. It has various uses, aesthetic and practical. It is used for cooking and drinking. It is used to store the sun, moon, and stars until Raven releases them. Bentwood boxes are also used to disguise or imprison Raven. The raven carved on the box, housed in the Princeton University Art Museum, references all of these uses, while it's also a figure of creation, cosmology, and social structure. It connects pictorially to Kuchain's raven cycle, demonstrating, for example, how raven might take on a disguise and conceal himself in a bentwood box full of water for a transformative purpose, as in raven in the daylight. 
Clinket Raven cycle tells of a myth time that precedes the beginning. Light and form appear in medias rays, with the raven stealing the sun, moon, and stars from carefully guarded wooden boxes. Similarities between the Clinket Raven in the cycle and the raven in Genesis, read through the secret book of John, abound. Both ravens survive the flood that covers the earth. Both ravens play a key role in making the earth habitable again. Both stories contain a jealous male god and an ark in which certain animals are preserved in the face of ecological catastrophe. Huchain's version, as recorded by De Laguna, references Noah's ark in retelling the story of how animals survive the flood. The folklorist Anna Birgitta Ruth identifies such floods as a common motif among raven stories across many cultures. In each of these story cycles, creation is conjoined with a fall. Creation happens through an act of disobedience, making existence inseparable from disobedience, and salvation inseparable from global destruction. Unity brings forth fragmentation, whether the ark, the garden, or the clamshell washed up on the beach. In Raven and His Uncle, told by Kuchain, the moon, who was also Raven's uncle, has enslaved the world's inhabitants. And this is the first quote at the top. The moon is able to do this because he controls the tide and has the ability to flood the land. In Kuchain's retelling, Raven's toughness and his ability to circumvent his uncle's authority comes from rock, the raw material from which he derives. Rock makes Raven impervious to death and undaunted. We learn in a subsequent story, Raven and the Daylight, version 2, that Raven comes from a low tide stone. Therefore, he cannot be old and cannot die, immortal but not a deity. Ushered into the world by his spiritual grandfather, the killer whale, Raven's first act is to save his mother from a flood by hiding her in a duckskin raft. Then as she floats, Raven flies to the sky and sees the moon, his uncle, being lowered into a bentwood box. In Raven and the Whale, Raven flies into the spout of a whale during one such period of floods and claims it's inside as his home. He builds a fire which melts the whale's blubber all over the raven's body. And as the whale dies, the raven's song carries him to the beach. The villagers cut the whale open, and the ra raven flies up and out. A great moment of liberation for the raven. The scene parallels the biblical raven's release from Noah's Ark. Kuchain performs the raven's liberation through the raven's own song in the fourth line of that second quote below the, um, before, below the red line. This pattern repeats throughout the raven cycle. Raven's song, coupled with an upward flight, often as an act of self-liberation. So in its ascendance, the raven gets lost in the sky and vanishes to sight. The villagers carry the fat from the beach and cook it in bentwood boxes. In the story, however, the raven does not say, stay lost in the sky. As with his mythical cousin from the book of Genesis, his flight in the cycle takes on the to and fro structure. That motion situates Raven in the in-between space between earth and the heavens, and between the realm of myth time and the historical present, ever narratively present through the medius ray structure of the Raven cycle. A few lines further in the story, we are told that Raven comes to town, meaning that he returns to the human realm. Kuchain tells us he flew back from way over there. And when he returns, the raven eats the whale, skin and all. Belly full, he goes on to liberate the Earth's inhabitants in the next story cycle, which is Raven and Daylight, version one. In Kuchain's version of the story, Raven encounters the daughter of the head of the Nas River, transforming into a down feather and dropping into a bentwood box. The daughter then drinks from the box. She swallows the unseen feather and is impregnated by Raven. Born as a human child, the raven tricks his adoring grandfather into opening the box, which releases the stars, the moon, and finally sun. With daylight's liberation, raven transforms into his former self and flies out of the smoke hole of the house, carrying the box of daylight with him. Another scene of liberation. 
In Kuchain's Raven cycle, we see a pattern of Raven as emancipator. He also excels in liberating humans, though they too fall victims to his pranks. Kuchain concludes this cycle by singing a daylight song about the release of light from the Bentwood Box prison. Daylight signifies a release from cyclical enslavement with which Kuchain began the cycle. Daylight balances the moon's powers, diminishing the threat of tidal flooding. But this is not a telos, not a movement from darkness to light, from enslavement to freedom. Meaning is revealed, but then hidden again. The last line of Kuchain's recorded raven cycle are these. It's just him, a song from down below. This raven is calling the end from the beginning. It's just him. Into himself he calls the end from the beginning. Calling the end from the beginning nullifies both. The raven's flight, the flying back from over there, structures the arc of the raven cycle. Stories are told in no particular order. Patterns of imprisonment and liberation repeat. The raven moves between myth time and human time. The end is coterminous with the beginning, denying a sense of linear narrative progression and closure, and that is the point. The raven's flight itself commands the medius rays structure of the raven cycle. At the end of Raven and the Tide, told by Emma Marx and translated by Nora Marx Dauenhauer, Raven's nephew shoves Raven into a Bentwood box, a punishment for an insatiable appetite. The nephew then ties the box, but Raven has been here before. He urges him to use something stronger, a confident dare. The nephew ties the box with either cedar bark or pointed ferns, and there was discussion between Willie and Emma Marx as to which it was. And then the nephew hurls the bound box from the top of a mountain. You can probably guess what happens to Raven. With a caw, Raven flies right into the next story. Each story begins and ends in medius rays with a to-be-continued conclusion. In this case, a literal cliffhanger. The caw becomes a vessel for intergenerational memory. We are assured that his flight will continue through story. The enigmatic status of the raven's flight adopts easily to Clinkett raven stories, but it does not fit within Judeo-Christianity. Through a flight pattern that presents a different order of things, the raven unsettles linear, clear, and managed order. A consumer of dead things, the raven brings the ghosts of the past to the present. The Bentwood box that sits in the Princeton Art Museum waits for the raven to come to life through story. The position of the raven carved toward the top of the box, like the box as a whole, references the myth cycle of the raven creator who once upon a time released the stars, moon, and sun from just such a box. Its material presence illuminates just how intertwined indigenous and settler histories are. After beginning to reflect on the stories connected to the box, it no longer seems possible to read the raven as devil or pose raven as supernatural prophet apart from its resonances in the Clinkett raven cycle. Reimagining the archive beyond its settler colonial history requires a new method of reading through juxtaposition and prolepsis. In addition to similarities in plot, the flood, the disobedience to a god figure, the recursive flight pattern, there is a thematic parallelism. At the heart of the raven cycle are reflections on an irreducible complexity, the chaos of origins that is also at the heart of Christianity. The comparison between the Clinket and Judeo-Christian raven highlights not only different modes of storytelling, but different ways of inscribing epistemology on the natural world. In the 19th century, all of North American nature became settler evidence of the Bible's accuracy and a source of prophecy for America's millennial importance that cast aside those who do not fit within this vision. In contrast, in Clinkett mythology, the raven provides a recourse to a larger cosmos structuring the universe, not as an emblem, but rather as an actor, moving through the universe and giving it new form, new light, new life. While Clinkett ravens can be destructive, they are life-giving, ravenous, but nurturing. Paradigms in Western epistemology unify through categorization 
into modern typologies. But these categories radically distort nonlinear forms of thought. They refuse, for instance, the cubist-like perspective that allows the Bentwood box frog and raven to take their full form only through multidimensional perspectives. One has to turn the box to capture the image, an apt metaphor for alternate perspectives that do not align with the neat organization of knowledge production into discrete categories. In calling the end from the beginning, Raven's song moves us permanently past fictive origin stories. Calling the end from the beginning reorients the perspective on the stories that might be told about America's past. Retrospection enables reading forward without the lacuna of telos. What the raven was for thousands of years in North America is also what the raven becomes, a prophet as Poe proclaims, or rather in the words of Emma Marx at the end of her telling of Raven and the Tide, maybe that's how it happened. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rivet. Sorry, we had some mic feedback there, so I had to turn the, the microphone off. Um, if you'd like to entertain some questions now, thank you for sharing your presentation with us today. That was very fascinating, the comparisons. Um, it, one question from the YouTube stream. Uh, Jeff Lear asks, Bishop Innocent Venim Minov had the theory that the Nestorians traveled through China and reached the New World, preaching Christianity to the inhabitants they found. Do you have any comment on there or any, is any there, comparison? Is there, oh, oh, it's a question about a uh -huh. comparison. Yeah. Or, Between traveling through China. Yeah, the Nestorians, the, if, uh, I believe they're a sect of Christianity. Can Trav you tell me the name that was referenced? I'm just trying to orient yeah. the, the century. Uh, um, Bish uh, Bishop Innocent Veniam Minov, I think he was a, a Russian Orthodox priest. I'm not sure. Right. Okay. Perhaps um, somebody in the audience. That's okay. I can, I can, I can try. Okay. <laughs> I mean, our reflections on comparison. It's hard. It's hard to make a comparison. I mean, I think one of the um, things that I'm, I'm trying to do. I, I suppose I've written a lot about missionary work, and um, one of the things that's interesting about um, missionary history is the archive that it leaves behind. Um, I think that, um, as, as hopefully was clear, that I'm aspiring to do in this project. I didn't talk a lot about Sheldon Jackson. That was, that was intentional um, because I think that one needs to find ways to read against the grain of the missionary archive in, in the same um, ways that I was trying to suggest reading against um, sort of ca categories of, of knowledge in, in this particular talk. Um, so I think that the parallel would be a structural one that in each case, um, of missionaries going into cultures that are completely different and assuming the kind of universal truth of, of Christianity and trying to map that universal truth onto a population, um, they had to get to know that culture to some degree and left behind things that are, um, in fact, important points of knowledge and information, um, but that to access that knowledge and information, we need to find creative modes of, of kind of reading against the grain of, of how they um, commented and, and reflected on that culture. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions within the audience? I can run the mic to you. Uh, thank you for your words. That was wonderful. Uh, I wanted to just share a little bit on um, calling the end back to the beginning. So I was doing work on Kuchain, Frank Italio, and um, we had found that there was, he had told the stories in a series, and then I think they asked him to do the song, the Daylight Song. And so he wanted to sort of do this retelling of all of them really quickly. And then, at the, and then he started saying, but that wasn't the first time I had heard that. We were working on a different story, and Raven does this thing where he starts to sing things into existence. And he uses these very complicated verbs. Uh, 
for those of you who like to nerd out on the language, they're hortative verbs. And so he'll say um, things that are very hard to translate to, like, which I think would be, who could let a person cut a person out or cut above a person? But then when he started singing like that, the first time I heard that term was from Marge Dudson, and she says, That's what she, he's starting to which is um, the way the word kind of works is sh is the end, k is a long something, the l is a classifier, and chuch is to summon. And then the s apostrophe is to do something in a repeated series, like sewing or something. So I started thinking about this word and looking in uh, Jeff Lear's notes especially, and he called it, and he was noting, and I think other folks were noting that in the Nash Story Dictionary, it's to compose a song that requires a response. So then there's this other sort of thing, and that actually could be a name for some of the love songs that are sung. And so then I started asking different speakers about it, and I was going to Fairbanks and ran into Kin Gisti, David Katzik, and had breakfast with him. And I said, what do you think this word means? And he got really excited, and he said, that's calling the end back to the beginning. So he was the one, I think, who gave us that definition of it. And it was really fun. And I'm glad that um, you focused on that stuff, because it, it's interesting to me, and I guess here's my big question, leading up to a big question. So there's all these parallels between ravens and, and other things. And I'm always just so disappointed that there weren't more people exploring these commonalities rather than actively banishing our language and our culture. So why do you think there was an absence of that? I think Nation Story were probably the closest. They, they did a lot and they weren't, they didn't seem to be actively banishing anything. Maybe they were uncomfortable with certain body function verbs, but um, why do you think that they never really explored that, that they instead just tried to shut us down? Um, thank you so much, and I'm, I was taking notes furiously, so I'm glad that this is being recorded. Um, I just finished my first semester of beginning Clinkit, so I've got a long ways to go, um, but I definitely want to nerd out on, on the language um, myself. Um, by they, just a point of clarification, are you, do you mean the 19th century missionaries in particular? Well, most of them are missionaries. I, I guess Sheldon Jackson would probably be a pretty good target for that. I mean, I think, uh, so, so when I started doing this work, I was really um, working on this particular component of this book. I was like, why is the raven such, such a bad guy in Christianity and this complex, fascinating, multidimensional character in, in the Clinkett stories that I was reading all in translation. And um, I, I thought a lot about that. Um, and I think that it's the case that um, in order for Christianity, by which I mean sort of from Augustine and then into US um, nation state organization around Christian concepts of um, manifest destiny and so on, um, is, is so wedded to this um, linear story, and the raven stands in such strong defiance. The, ravens, the raven is too resistant to the structure that um, Christian theologians and then 19th century missionaries were trying to impose um, on the world, really, and on their story of, of what, what they were doing in going into Alaska, in this case, and um, and setting up um, uh, missions and so on. So I think that it that this particular case, because Sheldon Jackson does record the Raven story, um, but it's 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 used as evidence, like the boxes of paganism of the thing that has to be corrected. Um, and I think to the extent that he did hear what the Raven stories were really about at all, and and that's maybe a question. Um, that, that it's a threat. It's a threat to the entire Christian cosmology, the way that it's redacted. And what I'm trying to do here is to show that actually the raven in Genesis is much more complex and was sort of forced into this paradigm. Um, and so it's more aligned, but 
um, not in a way that was permitted by centuries and centuries of Christians as Christianity was used to accomplish things like, like colonization. Thank you. Gracias, thank you. Um, I have, there's more questions coming in through YouTube. Um, according to Frank Italio, the, the name Yeh, Raven, was applied to him by a different character a long while after his birth because of his misbehavior and antics. How do you understand the difference between empirical ravens, the birds, and the figure in Klinken mythology whose name is Yeh? Mm. Well, that's a great question. Um, I have to think about that. I am really interested in story and the relationship between story and natural observation. And I do think that there is a, a connection. I mean, I've been so excited being here to actually see ravens everywhere um, because they aren't in, in Princeton, New Jersey. I mean, rarely, but they're not everywhere. I've even been taking pictures. I look like a total tourist. But, um, uh, but that specific question about the kind of renaming and um, how, how it relates to, to ravens in nature, I have to think more about that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have any other questions within the audience? Oh. Goodness, Sheesh. Hi, this is Judy. Um, I just wanted to make a few comments. One is the difference between um, the white sacred raven that was the creator and then the black raven. And my um, mom made, related a story to me about um, the first encounters with the creation was, um, she said that uh, when they encountered the, uh, them, the, um, their concept of them was as beings, but in uh, English, they just said they were men, but she said they were beings. And my dad always tells a story about the, the cage ravens in England, mm -hmm. that if the ravens um, get out of this cage, that England would fall. So I just don't know if you have any more thoughts to add to my, these thoughts I had when you were talking. Thank you. I can definitely add to the uh, cage, cage raven part of, part of the question. I was thinking about this, that, I mean, the story about the ravens in the Tower of London is that if they leave, then the empire will fall. Um, the wings are, are clipped, which seems a kind of, um, you know, commentary on the insurance policy against the empire falling, right? And um, a lot of ravens were kept as pets in, in the 19th century in particular. Um, Poe's raven in the, in the poem um, was based on Dickinson's, Dickinson's poem, um, sorry, Dickinson's novel with a raven called Grip who was actually kept as a pet. Um, and so I do think it's a, the case that in a lot of the um, Anglo-American Anglo and sort of um, but particularly, I think, Anglo-American and, and British literature of the 19th century, that um, the imaginary worlds of, of thinking about the raven as a literary character um, pertains to sort of domesticated ravens. Um, and I was thinking about um, the kind of, the, the irony of that and the way that it's another version of um, uh, what I was, what I was trying to ex say a couple of minutes ago in response to Lance's question about um, uh, the raven as, as a kind of threat, you know, that, that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a narrative way of um, expunging that threat, but it's a sort of literal process of trying to, to d domesticate um, the raven. Do you have any other questions within the audience? I was wondering about, um, in your comparison with the biblical raven or the <clears throat> Western traditions raven uh, and the clinket raven, I mean, there's one, there's clearly some similarities there, but there's a fundamental difference in that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but insofar as you presented it here, the biblical raven is, after all, a raven. It's a bird, right? It remains a bird, mm -hmm. it is a bird. <laughs> yeah. And there's a fundamental difference between a bird and a human. Those, those lines are not crossed, uh, so to speak. Whereas Clinkett Raven 
it's not clear what he is, at least not to me. Mm -hmm. He's many things. Uh, and he, he transforms, right? He transforms the world. So the world's much more mutable when you look at it through the Clinkett Raven's eyes. Mm -hmm. It's much more fixed uh, in the biblical, when you see it through the biblical Raven's eyes. So I was just curious how you see, I don't think it's incommensurable, but how you see those sort of fundamental differences between views of the world and what Raven is. Yeah, I, I love that question, um, and you're right. And I, I certainly don't mean to collapse differences. I think in the case, I'll, I'll just take, take the Bible very quickly, um, that the raven that appears in Genesis 8-7 and then kind of reappears a couple of places is, is sort of a, a lost narrative opportunity in the Bible. Like, it, it doesn't go anywhere, and so people don't know what to do with it. It stays a raven, whereas the dove becomes the Holy Spirit. You know, so there are um, biblical characters that have that same kind of phenomenon of, of turning into something else, of, being, of becoming mutable, and of allowing for a, a sort of unfolding of the plot. And it doesn't happen with the raven in the Bible. However, I think, um, you know, if you take even the um, Gospel of John that I was trying to do, that, that there, there could be a, a link there. You know, the light being Sophia becoming the raven, and... Um, within something like um, Poe's poem again, you know, the, the raven is supernatural. So I think that um, you're certainly right that the Bible is a sort of about keeping the raven a raven and sort of stunted in that, um, that state of existence, um, but that there are in stories about the raven that emanate out from that or that even are, are sort of critical or departing from that, um, that there may again be similarities along the line that you're um, explaining of, of kind of mutability and, and transformation. Um, but I'm, I'm wary of collapsing these crucial differences. Like it's a, it's a constant balancing act that I'm, I'm trying to do and that I'm grappling with. So I really appreciate that question. I'll think more about it. Thank you. Do we have any other questions in the audience? Can run the mic around. Hi there. Um, just want to thank you for your uh, fascinating character comparison between uh, Yeish and Raven. Um, my question was: uh, we we see um, that you know in the Western canon, uh, Raven is more of a static character, and and his characteristics are. You know, um, like you've already mentioned, um, more negative uh, qualities and whatnot, whereas uh, Yesh is much more complex and uh, interesting in a lot of ways. Um, uh, one, of, one thing that I think about is the, uh, the many differing interpretations you can have of uh, some of these traditional uh, oral stories, um, especially in the Raven Cycle. Um, I was wondering, um, because one of the ways that I interpret uh, for example, um, Raven and the Whale and uh, Raven and the Box of Daylight, um, respectively. The way, one, one of my interpretations of those stories are um, as uh, Yeith, as a character who undergoes uh, the journey and the return um, through the whale, and the whale being a, uh, a symbol of the underworld or the subconscious and, and making that return trip back. Um, and then Yeith as a, a character who brings um, enlightenment in the form of daylight. Um, I was wondering if there's, if you know of any examples in uh, Western canon that um, mirror or parallel um, maybe those two uh, interpretations of those uh, Raven Cycle stories. You mean ex examples of, of Raven stories in the, in the Western canon that parallel? Yes, yeah, yeah. If there's any um, stories in, in Western canon that um, echo or parallel um, or, or may differ, but um, in some ways uh, kind of uh, share, share some of those same themes. Yeah, I'm just going to ask one more question. And the, themes, the themes of kind of um, coming from the subconscious and into light, spe specifically, ra rather than the, the 
kind of narrative arc of the story. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, I mean, I think supernatural is as close as I could come and profit, you know. Um, so I think that in the more secular literature, there's much, there, well, I don't say much more, but there is more complexity and more intrigue. Because, I mean, fundamentally, the raven is, is, is interesting to someone like Poe or to Dickens because of its kind of complex nature because it's, it's kind of you know, a, a, bad, a bad guy in Christianity, so it's more fruitful. Um, so there definitely are uh, numerous associations of, of ravens with, with kind of supernatural and, and, and prophecy. Um, but bringing light, nothing specifically comes to mind, although maybe in, um, maybe in some more kind of contemporary fiction, um, there's um, a novel from just a few years ago called An Unkindness of Ghosts um, that features a, a raven story um, that I think you could, you could interpret the function of the raven story as a form of liberation um, within that text. Yeah. I'll keep thinking about that, though. Thank you. Anybody else have any burning questions? And Cheesh. Uh, well, I just thought I'd reflect on the names question for a second, because it's really, mm -hmm. I don't know the answer. Forgive me, Raven. I'm going to out the Raven here for a second, which is dangerous. But Kuchain um, repeatedly says it's the the little elder who sits on the tide, who, who names Raven, that his mother specifically never named him because stuff just went into motion too fast, fighting his uncle. But she calls him, not his mother, but this elder sitting on the tide who's angry at him for standing in between her and the fire. And she calls him which is a doo-doo butt Raven, should we say. Nora would have a pretty a stronger translation than that, but it's not a nice name. And then I think Raven was also called Yehlyu when he was white, and then he became Yehl. But sometimes in versions of the tide, Gishdachu Gud Yehl, when he goes down among the bull kelp, he gets called Gidzanu, which we don't. I don't know what that one is either. But I think all of those are names for. Raven, the trickster, um, and Yeh would usually just say, you Yeh, uh, and that's how Raven is often referred to in the stories. But that's really interesting because I think if, if we're speaking Tlingit a lot more and you say Yeh, everyone's going to think of the bird. And then if you just said, you Yeh, and you gave it a pause, we would think of Raven, the trickster. But it's really interesting to... Um, to sort of think of that stuff and that he was really laughing when, when he talked about how Raven got his name, but uh, I think it'd be sensitive nowadays. Sheesh. Can I hand the mic off? One couple more questions. Do you have, would you like to give any closing remarks? I don't know if we have any more questions coming in. I mean, just gratitude. This has been incredibly um, great to hear your questions and your comments and to have this space um, to share this work. I'm, I'm really, really grateful. So thank you for, for being here and for your questions. And again, I'm really glad that it's recorded so I can refer to these questions and continue to, to learn. And if anything else occurs, questions or comments or suggestions, um, Please, please reach out. I'll be, I'll be working on this for a while. Cheesh, thank you for sharing uh, your expertise with us and your time. We really appreciated the lecture and uh, glad that, to have you here. So thank you.